For most of history, man has had to fight nature to survive. In this century, he is beginning to realize that in order to survive, he must protect it. If you've only heard of one famous oceanographer, that person is probably Jacques Cousteau, originator of that quote. For decades, the faces of ocean research were, 99 times out of 100, white men. On occasion, female masters of the deep arose, like the legendary Sylvia Earle. Despite the fact that oceans touch 151 of the world's 195 current nations, popular media persists in presenting the sea as the dominion mainly of men, and still mainly as that of white men. One study found that there are more white men named Mike who appear as shark experts on Discovery Channel's famous Shark Week programming than there are expert women and people of color. Want an anecdote to wash down that data? In 2017, I appeared in a show for Shark Week titled Sharks and Volcanoes. The host was a shark biologist who, coincidentally, was a white man named Mike. We had a great time looking at the relationship between sharks and volcanoes, but when the program was ready to air, we were informed the title was now the much more ominous Devil Sharks. I was not amused. I'm your host, Jess Phoenix, and this is science. Today, I am joined by two of the founders of one of the most intriguing and, in my opinion, excellent nonprofits that I've heard of in the last few years. Uh, the group is called Minorities in Shark Sciences, which, of course, makes a really cool acronym, MISS. Uh, and so we, today we've got Amani Weber-Schultz, who is the CFO for the org, and Jada Elcock, who is the director of PR. So yay, public relations. And these two fantastic people are PhD students, and they love sharks, which is why I wanted to talk to them. So that's my tiny intro. It doesn't at all capture who you are. So would you like to introduce yourselves for our listeners? Sure. I'll, all right, I'll go first. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jada Elcock. Um, yes, I am a PhD student at the MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Joint Program for Biological Oceanography, which is a mouthful. So I just say the MIT Hui JP for BO, which is still a really big mouthful. But <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Alphabet soup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, I guess I don't really know how to, what else to talk about. I'm I'm researching um, ecology, movement ecology of predators, specifically basking sharks is going to be one of the things that I'm focused on for my dissertation. Um, I've kind of been all over the place in the world of science, jumping back and forth between the east and west coast. But I grew up in the middle of the desert. So how I got to the ocean, we're not really sure. But here we are. So I guess that's me. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you about that in a little bit, because, yeah, that's a all kind right. of a convoluted path. But OK, so take it away, Amani. Hello, everyone. My name is Amani. I am also a Ph.D. student at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Not so much of a mouthful, but I usually just say NJIT. Um, I study shark functional morphology and swimming kinematics, which is indeed a large mouthful. Um, but basically, I'm just really curious about why they look the way that they do and that, how that assists in their uh, how that assists them in their environments and in swimming. Um, I also have been all over the place in the science field. I do a lot of science communication as well. And contrary to Jada, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, right next to the Pacific Ocean. So I guess we can see a slightly clearer line to you now <laughs> with that. Okay, so I have to, because I've, I've known of your work for quite some time now, because the science community on Twitter is pretty active. Uh, and you, you, you all and your other two co-founders of Miss were fairly active on social media. But so I have to ask Amani about pants. <laughs> yeah. <I love> okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, basically, you know, COVID happened in 2020. It was really sad and depressing for everybody. Um. And I was sitting at home with my mom watching Grey's Anatomy, as you do when you have nothing else to do and you're stuck in the house. Um. And I decided to just draw a shark with pants on in like two different orientations and post it on Twitter. And that turned into an entire thing of me 
basically drawing a new shark every single night with different ways of wearing pants. And some of them wear overalls and some of them have suspenders. I think I drew one that had roller skates on. God. Um, <laughs> And I just became the animal pants person. And I've kind of been taking a break from doing that because it's actually a lot of creative effort to think of how an animal would wear pants. Um, but I do like that I'm still the pants person because every now and then I get random Twitter messages or social media messages that are like, look, how would this thing wear pants? Or like, how would this thing play a harmonica or something insane like that? So I'm happy to be that person. <laughs> so basically, if shark morphology doesn't work out for you, you can just do a PhD on how animals would wear pants. So, okay. Yes, okay. indeed. Indeed. <laughs> okay. Granted, I like don't have a lot of pairs of pants. So I'm kind of a little bit of an imposter because I don't have any fun pants like all of my sharks do. <laughs> hey, we study that which we don't understand. So it's cool. It's cool. Um, all right. So changing tenor just a little bit, because I could talk about animals wearing pants like all day, but I don't think that's what most people want to talk about. So my knowledge of your organization, Miss, um, is basically it, it coalesced after the Black in Nature and Black Birders Week became a really prominent trend on social media. Um, and it was essentially a response or like an evolution of what came out of the George Floyd protests uh, and the racial reckoning that the country was going through, country and world in some cases. Um, <clears throat> and so obviously it speaks to representation, but I, I want to hear it from you two. Like, how did the push to create mist happen? And has your mission shifted at all in the almost three years since then? That's a really good question. I would say that I don't think our mission has really shifted that much. We've just kind of extended it and just like added more onto it of not just, um, not just, you know, providing uh, a space for all of these scientists, but also trying to get them the recognition that they deserve and um, being a resource for, um, all of these like media companies, like we're partnered with Nat Geo to come and find diverse scientists to, to feature in their shows so that um, people can actually see like, this is more of what science looks like. It's not just the same five white guys going out tagging sharks every time. Like, you know what I mean? So um, I think that our mission is pretty much largely stayed the same. We've just been able to provide more opportunities and more um I guess, reach for our members to be able to get their names out there and get their science out there, which is really exciting. Um, and in terms of like how it all was founded, I think that we all kind of realized like we were kind of sick of being the only person that looked like us in a room filled with our colleagues where you just look around and you're like, I feel isolated, even though you're surrounded by people. And that is such a a crappy feeling. It's not fun. And so I think that we all kind of just came together and we're like, hey, if we all were in a room together, it would feel a lot less isolated, wouldn't it? Because we all, you know, have some shared experiences. And so um, out of that came Miss and they were like, I think it was Jasmine was like, LOL, we should start a club. And then she was like, no, for real, we need to do this. And <laughs> we got together on Twitter, started a group chat. None of us had ever met in person. Um, and then we had our first Zoom call. And two weeks later, we launched a nonprofit organization with no experience on how to get it started. But that's what we did. <laughs> yep. So basically, you built the car as you were driving down the road. <laughs> 100%, yes. We're still building the car, if we're being honest. <laughs> oh, yeah. Our car is a little rusty. We're trying to get some body work done. <laughs> well, it's, it's having fine. it right next to the ocean all the time. It just oxidizes. What can you do? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. So has it been a largely positive experience or has there been a lot of the, the more serious aspects that people of color and people from traditionally underrepresented communities in the sciences, you know, is, is there more discussion of, of that at all? Or is it basically a... Like we're doing this together and we're going to make it great. Like is, or is it a mix? <laughs> I feel like it's, it's an all of the above situation. Like I think, especially for me personally and Jada, let me know if this is the same for you. It's been an overwhelmingly positive experience just to know that we are making a difference for, for people so that they don't have to feel the way that us four felt when we decided that shark science was the thing that we wanted to do. Um, and so I've gotten a lot of joy in just being able to be a part of an organization that is able to create these opportunities for our members and see all of their like smiling faces and 
see some of them go to grad school after doing a fellowship with Miss and things like that. Um, so overwhelmingly positive, and I think also positive in the fact that it seems like since we founded Miss, those talks that you specifically talked about are happening a lot more, which I think is also a very positive thing because they needed to happen. And I think that Miss kind of created a large looming presence that was like, this must happen. And so a lot of people kind of fell under that umbrella and they were like, okay, if this one organization is doing this, I think it's doable for all of us to also do it as well. Yeah, That's pretty great. I think I would and... agree. And I, I would agree. I kind of had the same sort of experience of it has been very largely positive. And of course we have like the negative comments of like, why are you making it about race? And I'm like, mm, jokes on you. You've kind of made everything about race. That's why we're doing this. Like, hello. Um, and so we've of course had, you know, some negative commentary and it's a fact of life that that's going to happen no matter what it is that you're doing. So we just kind of, you know, if it's a valid, if we get valid criticism, we obviously take that to heart and we like consider what we can do about it. But if it's just someone mad because they're going to be mad, then we kind of just push it off to the side and say, we don't have time for you. We have a lot of other important things to focus on. And that is providing opportunities and experiences um, for our members and creating a community that we think was and still is very needed and important. So, yeah. Excellent. And I mean, it's your, your conviction and your caring for this really shines through. So I think that's what people look for in, if they think about a nonprofit they want to support or a group they want to be part of, they really want to see not just themselves in the group, but they want to see like a good version of themselves. And so I think that when, as far as it comes to representation from my admittedly not very important position, it looks to me like you all are killing it. So um, I just, I think it's so great. And it's not something I would have heard about when I was in grad school um, in between like 07 and 2010. So we're having, we're talking about a huge cultural shift that's happened in less than a generation. And it's because of people like you. So that's pretty cool. And uh, all right. So I do want to talk about sharks now. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, because uh, you all like <laughs> sharks and sharks are just the most badass things. Like, I mean, I obviously study volcanoes, so I'm no stranger to people going, oh my God, it's so dangerous. How do you do it? You know, and I'm like, yeah, but there are people who do sharks. There are people who do lions. So like sharks and lions are are my tie for like the coolest animals on the planet. And uh, so- It's a good tie. It's a good yeah. tie. <laughs> so I have, to, I have to get the terrible pun in there because I'm like pretty well known for my terrible puns. So I would like to dive into sharks. <laughs> if you have other terrible puns, please feel free to use them. And so I want to know, um, so Jada, like you mentioned how you grew up in the middle of the desert. So why sharks? How sharks? What? <laughs> Yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, I I lived in landlocked states my entire life growing up. Um, I went to undergrad on a mountain surrounded by desert. I was nowhere near the ocean until the age of like 22, which was when I started grad school. Um, and I think that it all just kind of stemmed from curiosity that snowballed until it got out of control and science no longer had answers for me. So I had to find the answers myself. Um, my brothers and I always like when we were little, we used to go outside and just explore whatever environment we were in, um, looking for spiders and scorpions and snakes and lizards and whatever else. And I I think that the curiosity of the ocean, like an ecosystem that I didn't have the opportunity to explore, just kind of pulled me in. And I had all these complex questions and I was like, okay, I'll watch a bunch of like documentaries and like nature shows and stuff. I'm like, Animal Planet and Nat Geo. Um, and I got a kick out of them. That was, those were like my favorite channels growing up. And I, I learned more and I became more and more curious and I got more and more complex questions until I was like, I don't think science has answers for that. So if I want an answer, I have to just go do the research and figure it out. And then I can help provide those answers to people who are also like, what is happening with these animals? Um, so I guess it was kind of the opposite of curiosity killed the cat. It was curiosity gave Jada a career. So 
<laughs> well, so I know this is this is a relatively new podcast because we haven't when we're recording this, people, we hadn't even released the first episode yet. So you don't know, but the tagline for the podcast is curiosity is the cure. So you basically just tied it in like boom, hundred percent you win something. I don't have wow. a prize, but I should get prizes and when I do, I will send you one. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what it'll be. It may be like UCS swag or something, but it, you know, whatever. I'll send you something because that was perfect. And, and Thank I you. firmly believe in that curiosity, that curiosity that you have when you're a kid is the kind of thing that, that inspires and provokes and, and just really ignites any kind of change we make in the world, I think. And, and that you guys are making change. I mean, this is yeah. great. And, and so I then have to ask Amani because you said shark morphology. Now my expertise in volcanology is lava flow morphology. So like the different forms and shapes that lava takes and you're doing the same thing, for, but for sharks. And it's funny because <laughs> I, you know, admittedly as a geoscientist, like I didn't think about animals having morphology, but they totally do. So oh, I, yeah. I want to know what got you into shark morphology. And then um, also oh, if, you, if you could answer for me, this question I've had my entire life, my burning question is why are hammerhead sharks a thing? And why are they so dopey? And why do I love them so much? Because they are my absolute favorite. But why why I, are hammerhead sharks? Yeah. I <laughs> love that really... question so much because I don't think anyone in science actually knows the answer no, to it either. The answer is we don't know. The, a with the hammerheads, there's a couple of like different things. The first is that along that hammer part, they ha it's covered in ampullae of Lorenzini, which is basically just an electroreception organ that allows them to sense electricity. So when we as people move, our muscles create little bits of electricity, and those organs allow them to sense that. And one of the things that hammerheads love is rays. And rays love to hang out in the sand where you cannot see them. So one of the theories is that they have this head which allows them to eat the thing that they really like eating because they can swim over the bottom and kind of use their little head as like a satellite dish that's pinging around into the sand until it picks up that whole electroreception um, or electricity coming from the ray. And then it helps them see where the ray is without actually seeing the ray in the sand. So they, it's really fun. You're telling me that basically sharks evolved like their own version of a metal detector for uncovering yes. stuff that's hidden in the sand. Oh my yes. God. Yes. And they, so cool. they use that as, they use it in general, right? So if you have a great white, for example, that doesn't typically swim along sandy habitats, they're still using that electroreception to sense different things going on in the water. Um, so all sharks have that, um, the ampullae of Lorenzini, and then they all just kind of use it differently. Um, but that's one of the more common theories I've heard about hammerheads with having that cephalofoil weird looking toolbox on their face. <laughs> so then, okay. So then back to the why, why morphology for you? <laughs> Cause yeah, so I can take you on digressions. Like we can be totally swimming in a different ocean here. See another bad pun. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, thanks for bringing me back. Cause I'm also a wander off to all the eight different paths that you can go kind of person. Um, basically, I mean, the short answer to why morphology is I have always really struggled in school, mostly because I have a really hard time with things like exams and being able to kind of put out conceptual thoughts onto pieces of paper. Um, and morphology became a thing that I was really interested in because my junior year of college, I met my now PhD advisor, and I loved how hands-on it was and how I could actually see the thing that I was trying to figure out in my head as an image, as opposed to something like math numbers, where I have a really hard time visualizing numbers and what they're doing. Um, and so like right now, as we're talking, I have something 3D printing that I need for research that I'm going to go do next week. And I built the whole thing in my head and then went online and built it into a space to 3D print it. And so I really love the being able to like visually look at something or visually create something that I have sitting in my brain. And morphology just let me be like, why shapes? Like, why are you shaped like that? What is this shape? Why do you why do you look like that? Um, and it just ended up being the thing that I was the most curious about and also felt the most, I think, attached and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It felt like a route that wasn't going to make me feel stupid, for lack of a better <laughs> word. <laughs> no, that's totally fair. And, and I think, so I know a lot of people get scared off from science because they think, oh, I'm not a math nerd, therefore I can't do science. And one thing I used to say to my students when I, I taught at Cal State LA, I taught at Pasadena City College, and 
I would tell students who were taking like intro geology because they had to meet a science requirement. I said, you know, geology is great. You can walk out and touch it. It's not an abstraction. Like I can take you to a fault and you can see how the rock has deformed. You can see how the fault has offset and like moved the different layers that were once connected. And I think what you're saying basically is that you like the tangible and, and because it has meaning, I mean, the things have the shapes they do for reasons. It's not random. It's not chance. And, and to me, that makes me think you should come out and look at rocks with me sometime. <laughs> oh, I'll yeah. sign me up. I'll bring a shark. I'll bring a shark with me. You can get a shark. I can get. <laughs> Although, you can know, too? yeah, you, of course you should come. You're a desert person and you know where you can find shark yeah. fossils often is deserts. <laughs> so yeah. we it will go so and we will use your desert skills and we will use your 3d brain skills, Amani, and you and Jada and I will go have fun with rocks and sharks. And I'm perfect. Okay. Actually, yes. one time I was in Australia working in a mine and they were digging through layers of um, sandstone and shale and siltstone and because that's where you had coal deposits. And somebody actually started like screaming, like, stop, stop, stop. And because they were using an excavator to like dig away this part of a wall, they came across like an almost fully intact shark fossil. And it was like five feet long and stunning. And I mean, all of the geologists are there like, oh my God. And even, you know, the miners, the miners could see it too. It was something that you didn't have to be a science nerd to appreciate. And it was like, yeah. it just made me, it made me sad too, because I'm like, how many things like that have we destroyed un unwittingly these records of the past, yeah. you know, it's, uh, that's a whole different issue. Yeah, and it's really, that's, I'm amazed that you found like a fully intact yeah. shark skeleton because they do not fossilize well. I was just all. thinking the same thing, like cartilage does not fossilize well. So the whole, like, I, it's yeah. not common to find like an entire skeleton, like teeth, for sure, yeah. because they're hard and like the jaws get calcified. So I get that. Yeah. But like the whole fossil, that was, that's, I it, would it was nuts. My entire mind. <laughs> I think it was, so I don't know how well they ended up being able to preserve it. I think it was reasonable, but you could see what it was, but the inside parts weren't super well defined, but you could see the outline. And I think it was because the conditions that form coal often are very boggy. And so it may have just had a longer time for the process to occur. Um, and, and maybe that had something to do with it. I'm not a paleontologist. Maybe I will ask a paleontologist about this. See, I love talking to people and we're all scientists here, but we're like, wait, but we still don't know everything. And that's the joy of science is not knowing. It's not having all the answers. It's getting to ask more and more questions and being better about how you ask the questions. And, and, and processes. Yes. It's so cool. And because like this interdisciplinary approach, when you go like, oh, what would the geologic conditions need to be for a shark fossil to form? And how does the shark's evolution show us stuff about the conditions of the oceans when the shark was alive? Like, what was it preying on? And, you know, do we still have those things today? I just think that kind of thing and how it all connects and intersects is just really exciting. <laughs> so so asking about sharks, um, Amani, you mentioned great whites, and there's been a lot of news about great whites recently, especially because they seem to be making a comeback off the coast of California, where I am. So they've been in the news. And I've also been paying attention, not just because I was talking to you two, but I like sharks. Um, but I was I was reading something in Nature, and uh, the magazine Nature, uh, and it basically said that 59% of, of reef associated sharks and rays are under extinction threats. And but like on the flip side, the UN just agreed to the high seas treaty. So that would put like 30% of the world's oceans under protection. So like, I'm very realistic. I, I know the score with climate change. I've done climate research, like I get it. Um, so we have the changing climate, we have growing populations and we have things that we want in our lives because it's the 21st century and people don't want to give up their smartphones, et cetera, or their merchandise that needs to be shipped across an ocean. So is the high seas treaty, is it something or steps like that? Is that going to be enough to protect the sharks? And in your opinions, like what can we do to get our acts together? Because I don't want to see sharks disappear. I, I don't want us to make them go extinct in, in our lifetimes or any lifetimes because they're such remarkable examples of, of evolution and biology and how specialized and how successful it can be if humans don't mess it up. Right. I think that that is 
a difficult question, obviously, which is why it's, I feel like, taken so long for us to make any headway when it comes to legislation on these topics. Um, but I think one thing to also consider is that like this, um, the High Seas Treaty is like a great step forward, obviously. Like it's, no one's going to look at that and be like, oh, that's terrible. Well, some people might, but <laughs> people who care about the ocean are going to look at that and be like, oh, that's terrible. And like, that's not going to do anything whatsoever. Um, but I think that it's also important to recognize that a lot of shark species are migratory. And so protecting certain parts of the ocean uh, is wonderful, but, and a lot of different countries have, you know, like their marine protected areas and things like that, um, where like fishing is restricted and things like that. But if you have a migratory shark that's crossing all of these like country and continental boundaries, you're going to have to have a lot more collaboration between these countries if you're actually going to do anything that's going to reasonably help their populations. Otherwise, I mean, they might get out of one country, move into the waters of another country and get caught there and die. So it's it's nice to, I guess all of this is to say, it's, it's nice to see these steps forward and it is very exciting, um, but there are also a lot of other steps and a lot of other things to consider. Um, but I do think, you know, protecting the oceans as much as we can is obviously important. And I don't think that we know exactly what the impact of that is going to be just yet. Um, but we will hopefully soon start to see what those impacts might be. And maybe it'll have some effects that we didn't anticipate. Um, maybe it'll be better than we think. Maybe it'll be a little worse than we think. And we'll just have to continue to assess um, as we move forward, what is and is not working and what else we should be doing to try and protect the oceans and the animals in it. Sounds fair. And Amani, any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I read that it took them nearly two decades to actually come to this agreement. So I would say it's a big feat in and of itself. And I also think that it really shows that we all understand that what happens in the ocean that is like a global commons or what we generally share that isn't just your own personal country's waters has large effects on every country and not just one or the other. Um, and so I think in general, like treaties like this, where people are coming together and really trying to figure out with the idea that things would benefit their nation, what also benefits everybody else in the global world um, is really important and really critical, especially with how we have been damaging the ocean over the last, especially I would say like 50 years. Yeah. I also think that it's important to note that I feel like we, especially people in like landlocked places, feel so disconnected from the ocean and like, oh, I have nothing to do with that. But we have everything to do with that. Our activities, whether it be our, our personal activities, like to a certain extent, of course, but like big industry activities and things like that are directly affecting the ocean. And we might think that we're disconnected from that, but all of that is going to come back to bite us in the butt at some point. And we're seeing that happening. Like, it's not like, oh, 50 years down the line, like it's happening right now. Um, we're finding plastic in our seafood and we're having troubles uh, sustaining our stocks of fish in certain areas. All these kinds of things that, you know, people are like, oh, that doesn't pertain to me. And I'm like, do you eat seafood or do you use certain products? Like all these different products that we use every day have things that come from the ocean. And it's things that we just simply never think about. But it, I think that it all just kind of goes to show like it is so important to protect the ocean and what we have now. Um, especially because we don't fully understand the ocean as it is right now. So that's going to make it impossible for us to understand and predict how that's going to change in the future as we continue to alter the ocean. So steps like this are huge and super important and incredibly exciting. And I'm hoping that we continue to see more steps like that going forward. That sounds pretty optimistic. And I'm actually glad you took it in that direction with people in landlocked states, because my one of the questions I was going to say is, why should people in Kansas care? Uh, yes, there was a warm, shallow ocean there way back in the Permian. We're talking like hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, and, and I do know that can be a challenge to reach people in areas where you know they may never have a chance to go to the ocean. They may never get to see a shark in person unless it's at an aquarium. So, I mean, it's, it's nice that you already hit that point. And so do you have any other thoughts about how marine scientists can connect with people who may not have the access uh, to marine environments? I 
I feel like I have a lot of personal experience with this, obviously growing up in <laughs> landlocked places. Um, and for me, I think a big thing was interacting with people at uh, aquariums um, and like recognizing that a lot of the people, whether adults or children or teenagers or whatever, that might go to an aquarium, like in the middle of Phoenix, like maybe they've never seen the ocean before, or maybe they have, but like only once. Um, and I know that there's also a lot of, you know, back and forth about animals in captivity, but I think it's important to consider that without animals in captivity, let's be clear, well kept in captivity, <laughs> Um, then we don't have the opportunity to educate people about the animals that are existing there. Um, and you can't expect people to make decisions about like laws and policies and legislation if they don't know or care about an animal. So I think that a big thing for me growing up was going to an aquarium and being like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing ever. I'm now fixated on this and it's going to be my career. That might happen for another little kid that lives in the desert. Um, and they might go forward to make some crazy awesome discovery in the future or something like that. And I feel like I'm rambling at this point, but I just, no, I love your great. <laughs> and I think they're really important. Um, and yeah. just general outreach, you know, making it a point to try and connect with communities that maybe you haven't connected with, or that scientists like Marine scientists specifically haven't been able to connect with previously, um, making it a point to try and find those communities and interact with them as much as possible because they have a lot of value. The people in those communities have value and you have a lot to bring to them as well. So, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. You weren't rambling. It, it all made sense. So never apologize. <laughs> it's uh, you don't need to, and you don't need to cut yourself off because <laughs> I mean, you have reasons for wanting to get that information out. And, and it just, it kind of makes me wonder like where we go from here. So obviously I don't have my finger on the pulse of the shark research community like you two do, but I'm wondering what you both see as the future of shark research um, from a scientific standpoint, but also from like a diversity and equity standpoint, because I know for a long time, science has had this model of having people from largely white, largely Western influenced cultures parachuting in to different locales around the world and trying to tell the people who were already there how to do their research <laughs> or not letting them do the research. So basically where, where is shark science heading scientifically and otherwise? Hopefully to a better place than it's been in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I mean, my like ultimate dream for shark science especially is that we reach a point where when we do things like policy making um, and when we talk about sharks and all the different aspects of our lives and of their lives that kind of interact with each other um, that we understand how valuable it is to have people from so many different backgrounds have a say in the things that we're doing um, because my whole lived experiences set me up to think in a very specific way but someone else's whole lived experiences gives them the ability to think of things that I would never think of because I have not lived their life. Um, and I think shark science has historically been super exclus uh, exclusive and very um, not welcoming to people who don't look a certain way or live in a certain country. And I really just hope that we get to a point where the research is super collaborative and we have tons of diversity um, because I think that's when science really benefits. I also wanted to add that I agree 100% with all of that. And I want to add that not just shark science, but all science needs native voices in order to succeed. They have an incredible knowledge and connection with the earth that a lot of us don't have. Or again, it's just the way that, you know, their culture and the way that they were brought up. This is a, a way that they think that a lot of us don't think. Um, and I think that their voices, I know that their voices are essential to actually fully understanding the earth and the processes that happen and the animals that we share the planet with and everything. So I just wanted to emphasize the importance of um, getting indigenous voices in into science as well. Yeah. So, I mean, talk about being exclusionary yeah. yes. to a population who can teach us a lot. Right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, there's so much inherited knowledge in different cultures and it's like, it's, it's foolish for science to ignore that 
because we can test the inherited knowledge. We can we can put it through the scientific method and learn and basically affirm or figure out, well, maybe something's changed since they learned this. And why is that? Was it climate change? Was it something else? And I just, I think that you have to look at the whole picture. So, and it seems like that's basically what you were saying. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do think having a more holistic view of the world is only going to help science going forward. And and so I really wanted to see for people who don't have a, a shark researcher in their orbit <laughs> and maybe they want to get involved in studying and I'm going to drop the fun word elasmobranchs uh, and, and you can explain elasmobranchs if you want. But if somebody if you don't know someone who's studying elasmobranchs, well, now everyone listening knows you too, but um, they, uh, if they don't have somebody in their backyard who's doing this, or maybe they live in you know the middle of the country um, and they want to get involved in conservation or research, like what, what sort of things can they do to further their curiosity uh, with sharks? I mean, right off the bat, I would say just like be very curious and read about the things that you are curious about. Um, I think especially with reading and especially if you don't have the access to a person who has all of the knowledge that you want. Um, making sure that you're reading about the things that you're curious about, but also that you're getting all of that stuff from different sources so that you have at least a holistic background of what's going on and then you can develop your own opinions um, is really important and also a really great way to just maintain that curiosity and figure out the areas that maybe you want to research or maybe this part of conservation is really interesting to you. And after all of this reading and watching shows and YouTube and podcasts, you realize that there's this like big gap and that's the gap that you want to fill. Like that's how you kind of find the areas that you can fit into. And that's like, that's basically what most people do with their PhD is they're, they're like, there's a gap here. I can fill this gap with the research that I want to do. And that's what scientists are doing all the time. And so just because you don't have a job that says scientist does not mean that you can't be one yourself. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree with all of that. I don't know how much I have to add. Um, I just also am a huge <laughs> Or science communication, if you're maybe not like, oh, I want to go into like research, but you want to still be involved with science, like you can be a oh, science yeah. communicator without being like a researcher and yep. help, you know, uh, I guess, what is the word? Encourage other people's curiosities as well. Um, and just share the information that you know and research new information to then continue sharing. And whether that be through a podcast or TikToks like I do, or drawing pants on animals like Amani, or uh, <laughs> like making a flyer to put around your university and be you, university, university. <laughs> it's, wow, it's, the, it's when uh, it's Words when are really hard. It's when the university merges with the nursery. That's what the you nursery, get. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. cradle to graduation. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, it, it's like the extreme K through twelve school, but it's like all the way through. <laughs> Um, putting up flyers around your university, um, just any kind of science communication. I always say that there's no wrong way to do science communication as long as you are conveying accurate science. Um, and also accurate. it's really fun. It I can help it. you. <laughs> yes. Um, it can help you learn about the things that you're looking into, and it can help other people learn. And I think that it just can create a fun community. And I just I love it. So you can go the research route. You can go the science communication route. You can do both. Um, or you can just, you know, listen and find the information when it's interesting to you. You don't have to be like super into science to be like allowed to enjoy science at the same time. I don't know. Again, feel like I'm yeah. rambling. But anyway, that's what you're, I think. You're definitely not rambling. No. I think the only thing I want to add is that I think an important distinction that I very firmly believe is that you don't have to do research to be a scientist. Yes. And I think a lot of people, especially how we're raised in the U.S. specifically, like you are raised with this expectation that scientists are doing research all the time. And that's what a scientist is. Like Miss Frizzle is what I thought scientists were um, or like Bill Nye or something like that. And I think it's really important to me for people to understand that be, there are 80,000 ways to be a scientist and doing research is not the end all be all to call yourself a scientist. 
Like in my head, I'm actually giving you a standing ovation. So I'll just sit and because I don't want to be off camera. But yes, and we can do the snapping. I mean, whatever, whatever's going to convey this. I mean, I, I feel bad for the people who are just listening to the podcast. So check this out on our YouTube channel to see our lovely facial expressions and gestures and uh, our clapping. And uh, <laughs> Jade and I, did I know I out. saw it too, Monty. We just oh, basically you, what you need to research is our people who study sharks and then start a nonprofit together somehow melt into becoming one hive mind because <laughs> yes. it seems like you two are on your way and I'm sure your other two co-founders are super you know you guys are all on the same wavelength which is fantastic and um I, I was gonna say I think it's really funny because when all four of us met for the first time it was very much like me and Imani are like the kids and like Carly and Jasmine are like the parents that are like, oh my gosh, these kids have so much energy. What are we going to do with them? And me and Imani are on the boat just like, yeah, dancing. <laughs> like, for no reason. It's the funniest dynamic ever. I love it, honestly. Oh God. So I did my master's with um, one of my advisors was at MIT Huey, Mark Kurz. Uh, and I was studying um, basically undersea lava morphology on uh, the newest Hawaiian island, which is still emerging. It's still underwater, uh, Louis Seamount. And I remember... I was kind of like you two just described yourselves because I'm running around the research vessel like, oh my God, this is so cool. Oh my God, we're piloting a submersible. And then Mark goes, you're like a science evangelist. <laughs> and I, I was like, I was like, you are correct. That is who I am. So it seems like you two are well on your way to being science evangelists. And uh, that's awesome. And so um, I I could talk to you forever because <laughs> this is great. And I do want to see if I can come out with you sometime, maybe this fall, uh, and get on a ship and wrangle some sharks because what is cooler than that? Um, yeah, especially yeah, if, if we're that. near a volcano, then we can get even more exciting. But if we're not near a volcano, oh. <laughs> it'll still be cool. Um, so um, but I got to ask you the last question that I ask guests. And uh, we, we've covered so much. We've We've talked about diversity and equity and racism and science. And we talk about drawing pants on sharks and dopey hammerheads. I mean, lots of things and how to get into sharks if you're maybe not near a body of water. Um, but this is, we, we are the union of concerned scientists here. And I have to ask you both as scientists. So why are you concerned? <laughs> why am I not concerned? No, I'm a <laughs> wild concern for my whole life. Literally, <laughs> I, yeah, I, how do I answer this question? Um, <laughs> yeah, this is, a, this, I've never been asked this. My no. brain is like, and I, I don't have an answer in like a file cabinet like, right. right now. It's also <laughs> like, I guess, why am I concerned? Like, it feels like a broad question. It like, is. Why am I concerned? Uh, I'm concerned because uh, racism is still very much alive and I want people that come into the field after me to have a better experience than I did. And I know also that I have had a better experience than the people that came into the field before me. Um, I am concerned because it seems like nobody cares about what's happening to the ocean and how we're impacting it. And the fact that it's seen as opinion of whether or not climate change is real or not in this country, that is something that I find incredibly concerning because most other countries in the world are like, I'm sorry, fact is optional now? What is happening in the US? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't get it. Um, I'm concerned because sharks are really cool and I am terrified to see what a an ocean without them would look like because we would have no clue what the consequences would be. There's way too many shark species. So not too many. There's so many shark species that if they all went extinct, never too many. <laughs> exactly. If they all went extinct, I would have no idea what is going to happen to the ocean. Um, and I am concerned because I want to keep having funding to do my research so we can find out more awesome stuff about the ocean. Um, but I'm also optimistic that things are moving in the right direction and I'm excited to see where things continue to go. And I'm excited for my research and Amani's research and everyone's research um, to see how we can advance in science and see what other cool things we can find to try and put a yeah. positive spin on things. <laughs> huh. Yeah. I, I mean, same, all the same <laughs> stuff. Um, I mean, I think that the only thing I'd add is like, I'm concerned 
for what won't be here for people who come after us if things don't change. Like Jada and I are both almost 25 and we've seen so many amazing things. And at the rate that we are removing animals from the planet and as it relates to us sharks, I am concerned that by the time I'm 80, someone will never see a hammerhead up close and personal, which is probably one of the most magical experiences that I have ever had. I, I get the same level of awe when I see a hammerhead that I did the first time I ever saw one. Every time. Every single time. Wow. I probably look like an absolute insane person with how large my smile is every time I see a hammerhead. And I don't want someone to not be able to see all of the amazing majestic animals that we have on this earth. And I think that the way that we're headed if we don't do things is to the point where there is a lack of amazing animals for people to see. Yes. And I... I... But to end on a high note... <laughs> Because that's what we're doing here. <laughs> I do think that we are heading in the right direction, absolutely, with da- passing different treaties and being more concerned about how we are impacting the planet. I don't think that we are at a point where there is absolutely no way to go back. I think that it's a matter of all of us showing how much we care and doing things to help the planet. Um, and then when I'm 80, hammerheads will still be around. Yeah. Yay. There's always hope. And I don't care if it's false hope. There's always hope. Yeah. Work towards the things that you think are important and stand up for what you believe in. Ah, that's excellent. You you two just absolutely killed it in the best of ways. And um, just so you can tell the listeners, because I like to give people tools that they can take action, you know, to better their understanding of whatever it is we talk about on this wild and crazy show. Um, Tell them your website URL, tell them how to find you on social and how to get involved. All righty. For sure. Um, so let's start with the Miss things. Um, Miss is, you can find our website is misselasmo.org. Um, and all of our socials, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter are miss underscore elasmo. Um, we also didn't explain what an elasmobranch is. That is a subclass of organisms, um, cartilaginous fishes, a subclass um, that is comprised of sharks, skates, and rays. Anyway, elasmos. No, I'm glad um, you got it in there because I was like, we're yeah. talk about it, but I was going to make a footnote uh, on the website. But thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, so Miss underscore Elasmo and Miss Elasmo dot org. Uh, my personal stuff is on Twitter and TikTok is Sophistication. And on Instagram, it's Sophistication underscore because someone already had Sophistication. <laughs> Sadness. No, no. Um, my all of my personal hand, handles are curly underscore biologist. So Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, they're all curly biologists. Um, and my personal website is just my my full name, which I am salty at Zencaster because I cannot spell the whole thing because the character count doesn't allow me to. Um, is Amani Weber Schultz dot Weebly dot com. Um, and yeah, you can reach me through there. You can see all the fun things that I'm doing uh, and all of the Miss Elasmo handles again. That's great. No, it's it's fine. And we will put links to all of that um, on the actual page for the for this podcast episode. So thank you so much for being on This Is Science with me, Jess Phoenix. And you two are doing fantastic work. Um, thank everybody at Miss for me, uh, from me, for me. Thank them all uh, because they're doing <laughs> life-changing, world-changing work. And it's really exciting to me to uh, to keep an eye on what you're doing and to help promote it when I can. Because, you know, look, we're all concerned scientists. If we weren't concerned, we wouldn't be scientists. <laughs> so enough. thanks so much. And you two have a blast with your PhD work. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. This was a blast and a half. Yep. Absolutely loved it. Can't wait for our volcano sharks field trip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>